Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Hello, team. Welcome back to Comic Commentary. Tie-in issue, Free Comic Book Day. <laughs> In this series, we have been reviewing the Young Justice tie-in comics that folded directly into the story arcs of the animated series. And, oh, look, we forgot a story. Uh, my name is Rich, and I'm here with my uh, co-host, Emily. Hi, everybody. Uh, in Comics Commentary, we will be discussing how the tie-in comics, or this one in particular, relates <laughs> to the video game, the first two seasons of Young Justice, and the broader DC universe. But unlike our regular review episodes, we won't be having a Crashing the Mode segment, so consider this your spoiler warning. <laughs> we thought about this comic, and then we just totally spaced on it when we were doing the run. Uh, yep. Yep. Uh, if you would like to get in touch with us, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on our website, crashingthemode.com, on the yjfiles.tumblr.com, at our email address, whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on, we're on Stitcher, we're on iHeartRadio, we're everywhere. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it back to Emily. Or Hello, Megan. Our issue numbers and title for this week are nothing. We don't have an issue number. <laughs> this is the free comic book day, Young Justice, Batman, the Brave and the Bold Super Sampler. Full title. <laughs> and the story itself was entitled Face Your Fears. It was released on May 7th, 2011, and the timestamp in universe was July 25th. The episode tie-in for this one is that it takes place two days after the end of episode four, Drop Zone, and six days before issue seven of the comics, Rabbit Holes, which is the one with Artemis getting her little introduction story. Oh, right. The writers for this were Art Baltazar and Franco Orleani. The pencil was Mike Norton. The inker was Mike Norton. The colors were Zach Atkison, and the letter was Carlos M. Mangua. Just in time for your next mission. Our establishing shot for this issue is Robin giving us a quick one-page recap of how the team came together and what it is they usually do, because that's what you got to do for a free comic book day issue. Uh, this time, they've apparently been sent to Colorado by Batman to stop Psycho Pirate from stealing <laughs> plutonium, as one does, uh, which Robin notes doesn't really fit his usual MO, apparently, making this mission a little odd for all of them. Uh, it was odd across the board a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Psycho Pirate orders his gang of emotionally controlled minions uh, to take on the team, but Kid Flash attempts to face him directly and take back the plutonium. In the process, Psycho Pirate uses the power of the Medusa Mask, his emotion-controlling device, to force Kid Flash to face his own greatest fears, or in this case, insecurities, not being good enough to be the Flash's sidekick. No one is facing giant spiders or clowns. It's all personal emotional problems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Please see Godspell. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> don't don't send me off on another tangent. Uh, okay. Because we uh we then see each member of the team's greatest fears or insecurities or whatever they are. Uh, Robin's fear that he's too scared to be a good hero and that Batman and the team won't need him. Superboy's confidence issues about whether he will ever be as good as Superman and what exactly the genomes may have taught him at Cadmus. Aqualad feeling like a literal fish out of water, constantly feeling like he's drowning on dry land and trying to get control of that and prove himself along the way. And Miss Martian's struggle to adjust to an Earth that's nothing like TV, control her telepathy, and keep her own secrets all at the same time. But then Kid Flash remembers that his friends believe in him, and he's able to break out of the fear insecurity trance. The rest of the team is still out of commission, though, so while he takes on Psycho Pirate alone, throwing mud in his face and stealing the Medusa mask. Without the mass, Psycho Pirate's emotion control powers disappear and everyone is broken out of their trances. Kid Flash then discards the mask and steals the plutonium only to run directly into Atomic Skull. Uh, Atomic Skull then steals the plutonium back. Uh, but now that Psycho Pirate's powers are broken, the whole team is free to take on the new enemy. 
a fight ensues and an atomic skull escapes, but Miss Martian and Kid Flash are able to retrieve the plutonium along with taking down Psycho Pirate. Robin closes out this mini issue by observing how well the team is working together now and how adding anyone else to the team would totally mess with that dynamic. <laughs> Which is why you brought up the Artemis intro issue. Yep. <laughs> if you're yeah. reading the comics in order, Robin tells us that we shouldn't add anyone to this team. Two seconds later, we're adding Artemis to this team. <laughs> right, right. Oh, the dramatic irony. I think we both feel about the same about this, about the same amount of Aster about this one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's get on to that. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. Yeah, this one was, um, I don't know what to think of this one. Yeah. I don't know. I like the concept. It's a I like good the idea. concept. Yeah, it's kind of like reflective of the sitting around the fire telling stories yeah. thing where you're actually getting a look inside their minds, but none of that gets resolved in any way except yeah. kind of with Wally. Yeah. Kind of? Sort of? It's like, I don't think this was the right format for this story. They did not have enough space to do this kind of story justice. Yeah, let's do a deep psychological dive on everyone in a 12-page free comic day thing for kids. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I think as a writer, I would... So, I mean, you know, no throwing shade on Art Balthazar and Franco Orleani. I, I'm like, what do you do? You've got an ensemble cast in 12 pages to do a psychological deep dive. And then, like, Atomic Skull showed up at the end, and I was like, I, what? Like... Yeah. <laughs> what? That was interesting, but also, what? Like, I wasn't sure about that. There's too much going on to do it any real yeah. justice. And then combine that with the fact that it's a free comic book day issue that right. was literally lumped in with Batman the Brave and the Bold and thus forced to kind of be like a little more childish and a little more child friendly than some of the stories in this series get. Even some of the early stories in the comics get kind of dark. And this one feels like, it wanted to, but wasn't allowed to. Yeah. And so it all feels a little little awkward. And there's a lot of exposition because they've got to kind of establish who all of these characters are really quick in case one random kid picks this up at Free Comic Book Day and isn't familiar with it at all. Right, right. And it just, it just doesn't work as well as it could have. Yeah. You know, I mean, one of the things that it could do, though, is if, it, you know, a kid does pick this up or someone picks this up on Free Comic Book Day... It might allude at least to the idea that, oh, this show or this this comic is going to be dealing with some deeper issues, but we don't get any resolution in that because it was just kind of an intro thing, and may, it might encourage people to go look for more. And if you're not already like into Young Justice, you're probably not going to be expecting as much as like we would be. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I mean, there's some kind of... I guess it was just compared to the other, like you were saying, like I, how many people got murdered in like that first story <laughs> arc in the the regular comic? I think there's this death. Yeah. The show addresses some of this, at least with Miss Martian later in like image. Like we get that fantastic scene that is all of Miss Martian's fears, like physically manifesting. And it's like, that is a hard hitting emotional scene. And it feels like this issue kind of wanted to do that, but kept having to pull its punches to the point that like, Part of Wally's like insecurity thing is like I eat too much and it's thrown in there as like a joke and Aqualad has some awkward thing where he's like anytime the team makes popcorn oh, yeah, it feels the butter. like I'm drowning in butter. I'm like that does not fit tonally. It feels like you're trying to pull back immediately after trying to give us something heavy. Yeah, it was it I get what they were doing with Aqualad cuz like like olfactory sense is works completely different underwater. Yeah. And so when you're in air, like that kind of like butter's a strong smell, I get it. Like, but other things are strong smell. Like his senses must be enhanced in some way as well, being underwater, and I get that, but it was just it was a very odd analogy. Yeah. <laughs> that like could have been you could have phrased it, it differently. Or you could have picked an analogy that was when you're doing something like that, you wanna ideally you want to look at the character that you're trying to that you're representing and find a thing that jumps out at them. There's this God, who, um, Mary Robinette Cal is a is a fantastic author that I met a few times at um, World Fantasy back in the day. She's also a professional puppeteer. 
Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. What's interesting is listening to her talk and reading her stuff about what she does as a professional puppeteer and how it applies to how you write. And one of the things I found fascinating that I carry with me every time I'm writing something is what the puppet is interested in is what the puppet is looking at. You have no facial expressions. You have not a lot of subtlety in certain things. But when you're performing... If you're going to get character across for this puppet, you, you're you going to have it looking at the obviously at the thing that is drawing its attention. And in this particular case, it it's about sensory things. I think we talked about this a little bit when Morgan Jenkins came on and talked about talked about asking the right questions. It's this idea of what, what senses get drawn to certain things. So if you're going to do a thing like this, why butter? Like butter doesn't represent anything to Calder. So I wonder if there I just so it's something that I would that that you want to think about is like, how can I get character across as well as just the information? It doesn't move the plot forward. So you want to look at character and you want to look at information. It doesn't develop character and it gives information about like the fact that he feels overwhelmed above water. So you're doing one thing in the scene instead of two or three things in the scene. And so you could have done a second thing in the scene by deciding what in that, what in the, what in the, the space would like, why I just said it, but why butter? Like, why is Calder, why is butter a thing? Like, I guess butter is not a thing in Atlantis, <laughs> you know, but I mean, like, there's nothing that draws but, yeah. me into be like, oh, now I understand something like Calder's looking at something that's unusual to me yeah. that tells me something about what's going on in his head. It sounds like a ridiculous thing, but like when you're doing a scene like this, it's helpful to just do this to, and, and even for yourself, just to think about what would my character, what would the character really be like thrown off by and why Yeah, I think is important. I, so, I completely agree. I completely agree. In my notes, I just put butter because I, <laughs> I just had nothing else to say. I'm like, what? That was weird. Anyway. But Aqualad's panel does include a fun little Easter egg that I just find interesting that they <laughs> threw it in here. Mm -hmm. uh, in that same panel where he's complaining about popcorn, uh, there's a shot of the whole team watching TV, and it's something called the Flaming Sea. <laughs> uh, and the Flaming Sea was a parody superhero created by Conan O'Brien <laughs> and Bruce right. Tim on the late night Conan talk show that people may be familiar with. Uh, apparently, Conan O'Brien thought up the costume, Bruce Tim illustrated it, and they even produced a few videos splicing this parody superhero into existing Young Justice footage, and they even included a couple of kids dressed as the Flaming Sea in the Halloween party scenes of Secrets. Uh, if you look very closely in the background of some shots, you can see a couple kids with the logo on the chest and everything. And it's a really, it's a pretty ridiculous character if you look up, like, the actual full design. I encourage people to just to have a good laugh, but it amuses me that when choosing something to put on the TV, they went with that. Only I know. Two, what only is two TV shows exist in the Young Justice universe, Hello, Megan, and The Flaming Sea. <laughs> Apparently. Nothing else. I don't watch Conan O'Brien. I'm familiar with the concept of the Flaming Sea, but I don't. Yeah. I saw it. I saw it, and I was like, I knew enough to know what it was referencing, but I don't really get anything else about it. So yeah, uh, literally, this is the I only know about this because of Young Justice and because it made the rounds on the internet when it first <laughs> right, happened. Sure, yeah, but there are there's a couple of things like that happen in this that were kind of I don't know. They made me ask questions. <laughs> I guess. Okay. Whether they were the right questions. Well, Atomic Skull, the Atomic Skull thing. Well, when he shows up and I'm like, oh, it's Atomic. Why is Atomic Skull working with Psycho? Okay. This is a, this is a thing. Like, why is Atomic, I, Atomic Skull could just walked in and taken the plutonium. I don't know why he needed, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, he makes a comment about like, I don't feel like a non-believer such as you would understand that who does not accept the half-life would have anything that you would want to do with this plutonium. Something I'm totally hacking that paraphrase. Something like that. But there was like a bunch of stuff ran through my head. I was like, okay, half-life, is he making a plutonium joke? 
is it like a philosophical idea that he has based on the fact that half the half lives are basically like uh, not Occam's Razor, um, Zeno's paradox, where it's just gonna go on almost forever? Um, or I was like, for a second there, I was like, is Atomic Skull a zombie? Is he talking about being undead and he wants to make all these other people undead, radioactive undead zombies? I'm like, this is why. Is that why he looks like he's a mummy? Like, I had all these questions right through my head. And then, of course, we went to the YJ Wiki, because you should always go to the YJ Wiki. And there was a link to an Ask Greg pay, post. Uh, pay a post, thank you, that where someone asked that question. And he, he said, this is part of Atomic Skull's kind of personal religion. Hopefully it's just personal. Uh, well, hopefully. About the half-life, the immortality of, of radiation and half-life references. So that was, it's like, okay. That was a, that was an interesting choice to build character for Atomic Skull that appeared in a free comic day thing. And never appears on the show. Yeah. Or in another comic. <laughs> or the video game. I don't think he's even in that. Nope. He's used as a power, he's used as a power source in Revelations. Yeah. <laughs> that's basic. That's pretty much it. Um, okay. Interesting. All right. We... It's it's interesting. Uh, this issue also has <laughs> a weird little throwaway line where when they're going through the pages that have everyone's fears or insecurities or whatever they are. <laughs> they all whatever, seem like more insecurities than fears to yeah, me. Yeah, but. but they it's called face your fears. It's not called face your insecurities. Face your insecurities. Talk about your problems. Everyone sits in angst. a circle and talks about your feelings. Um, but Miss Martian has a line in her monologue, uh, where she just says, I have things that are personal things. I don't necessarily want everyone to know. And it's left at that and they move on. And this issue came out 10 months before image. So they just still couldn't talk about the white Martian thing at all. <laughs> right. Superboy is a thing too. Disney he says something like, "What else did they program in my head?" Which I guess yeah. could be just like, "Hey, that's fun anyway." But like, no, that's yeah, that's a yeah. thing. The Robin thing I it felt weird. It feel it yeah. I didn't uh, relate to that one. The show never really has Robin be scared. Yeah, and the scare. He was like, "He never faced fear, and my parents never faced fear, but I'm afraid." Of what? Of all the time? I'm afraid of not living up to expectations. Again, this isn't a fear. It's an insecurity. And then, I don't know. Like, and I can understand, again, the insecurity or whatever, that he, the team isn't going to need him. I'm like, you've been doing this a long time. And I guess everybody has some imposter syndrome, but that's interesting. And I know that Psych Psycho Parrot, like, turns up the volume on these things, but... Yeah. That was it. The other ones I get, except for the eating thing for Wally, I didn't quite understand that bit. And like Robbins even ends with, I'm afraid the team won't need me because I'm younger than everyone else. Like that's the end of it. And I'm like, that's never brought up. The yeah, show explicitly thing. like states that he does like he literally has his line where he's like, I've been doing this since I was nine. Like, being the youngest in the group right. has no effect on Robin, which is interesting. Yeah. And then the comic's like, he's worried that he's 14. I'm like, no, he's not. He's really never. He's not, He's not though. Yeah. And it would have been interesting if there was some stuff in there, in this, that ended up coming up later. Like, what does he say? He's got, like, a fear of disappointing Batman or... Does he does he say like I'm afraid I won't be able to be Batman? Does he say no. that in there? Right. So if he had said something like I'm I'm worried that I am not the person Batman is, that would have been interesting. No. Pulling up pulling up my physical copy of the DC Nation <laughs> Summer of 2012 magazine what is because that? I have a physical relic copy. of the Young Justice <laughs> fandom here. That's signed. <laughs> um he says, Batman isn't afraid of anything. Why did he choose me to be Robin? I'm afraid. I'm afraid Batman won't need me. Nothing about being Batman. Nothing about living up to Batman. Yeah. Just Batman won't need me. And I'm like, you've never thought that. None of that resonates with me on this particular level. But it would. But having him feed into that future 
conversation with Canary and, you know, that kind of stuff. That would have been kind of cool. That having Aqualads be about like all the stuff he left behind uh, right. and all of that. What about Tula? Like you, they could have made a reference to Tula because it wasn't that. I mean, you said it was between episode four. It was between. It was right after Drop Zone. Right uh, after Drop Zone. Right after Drop Zone. So two episodes later was going to be downtime. Yep. And so Tula was coming right up. Like you could be like, I'm afraid that I left things back home that can't be fixed then it's like oh no so now we know there was a background ish like he was already feeling insecure going back home because he looked confident but it would be really interesting if we knew that there was some kind of deep-seated thing going on see this uh, and some of the other comics do that some of the other comics yeah. have him like looking at his phone and looking at pictures of tula and thinking about tula and it's like that's great those yeah. are great little ways to build up to that moment, whereas this is just like drowning in butter. Yeah, and it, it, if this was any other tie-in series, like tie-in comic series, one we probably wouldn't be doing a <laughs> well yeah. style yeah. review of it. But also, we wouldn't be we'd be like, yeah, whatever. It was a cute story and introduce yeah. this character and blah blah blah. But it's not. It's Young Justice, so it's like. All right, this one didn't hit home. There are ways, things that we can learn from it to be like, how could we may have made this maybe more compelling or interesting or bring it up to the level of so much of the other quality of the show? Yes. Um, but it was also early on, and you know, you just got to give it give it some kind of pass to a certain extent. My only other two notes are another one of what is up with this story that includes when Kid Flash takes back the Medusa mask, he just throws it. He just throws it <laughs> like a frisbee into right. the middle of the city that they're in. And I'm like, honey, what are you doing? Nice. That is a super powerful <laughs> weapon. And you have just thrown it into a civilian area with no one addressing that that just happened. I'm like, I get it. You need to get it away from the situation. Right. But I'm like, you're Wally. You keep souvenirs. You're telling me that you weren't given, look, it's a cool thing. And went, cool, I'm keeping it. Yeah. It that's just, interesting. I was like, what and see, happening? wouldn't have that have been interesting if Psycho Pirate's mask was on like the top shelf of the bookshelf in the library and everybody was like, where's this, where'd this mask come from? That would have been really cool. Yep. Uh, and final thing that we mentioned before, but I'm mentioning again of just uh, Robin ends the issue by just saying, I just hope Batman and the rest of the Justice League don't mess with the dynamic. Can you imagine if they added anyone else to this team? Wink, yeah, it wasn't wink. wasn't subtle freeze frame ending this issue was actually released three months after infiltrator aired so it wasn't even hinting at anything artemis was already on the team <laughs> so nice. like we all knew she was here and then the comics like what would happen I'm like we know what happens yeah chaos ensues and, people and, you start know, it, fighting it could be it could have been it could have been okay it was just i think that i think the writers were rushed you only had 12 pages to tell this kind of complicated story and then yeah. like you know, I just don't. Yeah, it needed a few more drafts and like yeah. another twelve and, pages. And who knows what if they, they maybe they even got like, hey, by the way, we don't have enough story. Like we have a twelve issue story for Batman: Brave and the Bold. We need something else. Oh yeah, Young Justice. Let's throw something in there for that. Write this story real quick. I mean, we don't know what kind of time frame they were on, so. That can uh, that's also going to affect it. It's one I am not going to judge anyone when we have no idea what <laughs> right. things are going around around it. We're just right. like, and the only reason we hold this to such a high standard is because these creators have made such amazing yeah, stuff absolutely. before, for sure. But again, there's great things we can learn about, like what works, what doesn't work, and what we can carry forward. Don't reference butter in a dramatic moment. Don't do it. Oh, you can do it. Just make sure it's really d indicative of the character that you're having say it. That's all. <laughs> um, well, the only other interesting thing is, like, I was like, do I even want to do, like, a mini Secret Origins on Psycho Pirate? But I was like, actually, there's a couple of weird tie-ins to the Outsiders. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, let's do it. Also, I think it's funny that, so there were there, there are two Psycho Pirates. The original one was named Charles Halsted. And he was a criminal who planned crimes based on emotional states. And then there was Roger Hayden, who was the second psycho pirate. And he had a bunch of different kind of revamps and whatnot. But I just think it's funny if this ended up being the Charles Halstead psycho pirate. And then Kid Flash pulled the mask off, threw it out into the city, and it landed on Roger Hayden. 
There you go. You've explained <laughs> well, there you it. There's an You've explained it away. You're right. But I find it hilarious that this name is honestly ridiculous. It's a ridiculous villain name, and DC used it twice. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, they keep going. Uh, so the second psycho pirate, Roger Hayden, is the one that I'm sure it's this guy. But as I mentioned, he's had a bunch of incarnations. So from Crisis on Infinite Earths in the 80s, he had like a bit of a reboot in the 90s. And then he's got a current version in the New 52. So originally, he appeared in a similar way to this comic where the Medusa mask basically gave him all his power. So allowed him to turn up the volume on people's emotions. And, but he didn't have anything necessarily innate to himself that I'm aware of. But by the time you get all the way through these reboots into the New 52, Hayden is a, is a psychic and he can manipulate people's emotions on a s- certain scale but the Medusa mask actually grants him more control and more range and more power. Like at one point he's affected everyone in Metropolis with this mask. There was kind of an event thing going on that involved uh, a villain named Necron, who's basically Satan. And he was just given, <laughs> he was just giving everybody what they wanted. And, uh, it was kind of messed up. And I think Psycho Pirate was involved in that somehow because, oh no, was it the anti-monitor? It was just some, there's some super villain that was keeping him around and like enhancing his powers. I think there was something with Necron too. But anyway, it, he's usually just brought in to like, hey, we need this thing. Oh, Psycho Pirate's not doing anything. We'll put him in here, get him doing his thing. But like in relation to Young Justice... Two things, most notably, which I think is kind of funny, that Hayden actually appears in Batman Brave and the Bold, which was also in this comic. It was an episode called Inside the Outsiders, where Psycho Pirate captures the Outsiders and feeds on their emotional issues until Batman can stop him. And then that, and and the fact that at some point in comic history, Hayden attempted to take over or manipulate Markovia the country of Markovia by imitating Baron Bedlam, who was, uh, if you heard our San Diego Comic-Con recap, is an antagonist for Brion Markov, who is Geoforce, who is in The Outsiders, who is in season three. So I'm like, I, these are, we- I don't remember Psycho Pirate being involved so with The Outsiders. so many layers. But it's, <laughs> but it's really specific. Like he's, he's a Batman Brave and the Bold. They said, we're going to have Psycho Pirate and The Outsiders in an episode. So we're going to bring that in. I'm like, wow, are they even connected? And then like, but in the comics, I guess he keeps, he appears with the outsiders sometimes. We'll I don't have know. to see. I, I don't guess. know. We'll, we'll just see. have to wait and see. It probably means nothing. <laughs> but we'll see. We'll see. I want to see if they actually have a character named Baron Bedlam in season three, because I'm just going to be like, oh, it's just like one step worse than Sportsmaster. <laughs> I just like, uh, Side note real quick on all of this. I, I ha- as I said before, I have the like physical copy of this in, as part of a magazine where it was paired with Green Lantern, the animated series instead oh, right. of Batman, the Brave and the Bold. Because oh. that was what was on DC Nation at the time. Uh, but the thing that I find hilarious is that the cover includes a picture of Artemis. And I'm like, she doesn't appear in She's any She's not of any this. of the comics. They just used like the, Stock like, the art concept or... art of right. all of them with like their arms crossed looking dramatically at the camera and Artemis is like at the front of that and I'm like but Artemis isn't in this one that's really funny <laughs> the oh, same man. magazine that included a Young Justice word search uh, character profiles for four of the freshmen joining the team and a Young Justice invasion mini poster oh right such excitement I, I have questions Number Go one, can you scan that word search and we'll put it up on the, the YJ Files Twitter account? Are we legally allowed to do I that? I don't know. <laughs> I feel like we're not legally allowed to Something, do that. I, I, I feel like one, you're absolutely right. And two, I don't think anyone would care. <laughs> but I definitely want to see it for myself. We'll, we'll see. We'll decide. We'll, we'll, we'll consult we'll our lawyers. We, yeah. have two, we have two lawyers now. Our, our team sort of lawyers. <laughs> Our team of of Frank's Paul and Liz from Cooperatives Podcast, who sometimes like says, "Yeah, dude, don't do that." <laughs> okay. Other questions? Yeah. The I other question plural. was the four profiles. Let's let's go check. 
Let's were check. they wrong? Because in the actual physical comics, they described Superboy's powers incorrectly. Let's and there out. was some other stuff. And then I know that on the DC DC Nation website, they had Green Lantern listed as Green Arrow. And my favorite being that they once early se- early to mid season one, it was mid season one when they had character profiles up for all of the main six members of the team. Artemis's secret identity was listed as Sissy King. Oh, nice. You yeah, know, that's a good one. Even though she'd already been established as like, no, her name's Artemis Croc. And they're like, no, 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 we're putting up Sissy King. It was quickly taken down, but I distinctly remember seeing it. Right, right. Let me see if I can find these real quick. I'm flipping through this. Because the one that I was thinking of, I think it it was listing Superboy's powers. It was like strength and vulnerability, heat vision. And I was like, I did, what? <laughs> Wait, I, it's like, mm, nope. No, that's that actually, it's actually a thing that he doesn't have that. Okay. All righty. Okay, I have found it. Okay. So let's see, looking this over, trying to read this and stay with my mic. So they have profiles for Beast Boy, Blue Beetle, Lagoon Boy, and Wonder Girl. Oh, these were, I thought you were saying Robin and Kid Flash and them. So this was a thing for season two. Yes. Interesting. They were promoting season two with a season one, early season one comic. That's always fun. That tracks. Beast Boys says that after a Martian blood transfusion and a green monkey bite, Garfield Logan gained the power to transform into any animal he encounters. Calling himself Beast Boy, he's morphing right onto the team. Okay, that's interesting Uh, because they did put that bite. So the bite's part of his original origin in the comics, along with the bizarre disease they're talking about. But also, um, he did get bit by monkey in the in the, which we pointed out, which I thought was like a cute throwback, but there they're saying like, "Oh no, it had something to do with his powers." I'm like, "Really?" I don't, I don't take any of this as necessarily canon. Oh, but. it's canon. <laughs> uh, Blue Beetle <laughs> says that on the day the previous Blue Beetle died, Jaime Reyes found a mysterious blue scarab that immediately affixed itself to his spine, giving him the armor and powers of the new Blue Beetle. Uh, okay. Lagoon Boys, we got Lagan, a.k.a. Lagoon Boy, is a citizen of Atlantis and a graduate of Queen Mira's Conservatory of Sorcery. He's a surface world fanboy and ready to follow in the footsteps of Aquaman and Aqualad. And Wonder Girl... <laughs> bleh, words. Uh, Wonder Girls says Cassie Sandsmark is the daughter of an archaeologist and the Greek god Zeus. After Wonder Woman discovered the amazing powers of Cassie's birthright, she granted her new protege the name Wonder Girl. Yep. Okay. That's actually more than we knew about Cassie before. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. Interesting. Also, I think Jaime found the scarab is a little bit strong language. Considering it just exploded into him and he just took it. You know what? I get it. Feel like, wait, did he pick it up? Oh, he did pick it up. He picked it up, then it crawled around onto his back. So maybe yeah. he did find it, quote unquote. But I just in my head, I just feel like it flies through the air and just slams right into him. But that's not actually what happened. This, this same page also starts with the heading, Young Justice, you've met the seniors. Robin, Aqualad, Kid Flash, Superboy, Miss Martian, Artemis, Zatanna, Red Arrow, Rocket, Wolf and Sphere. Oh, they nice. count. They Excellent. count as seniors, apparently. I'm so glad they're getting credit. Oh, yeah. That's fantastic. So yeah, this these are these are fun facts you learn when Emily unearths an <laughs> artifact of I'm the glad Young I, Justice days. I'm glad I I'm, asked. I'm glad I found this. I'm yeah, so excellent. happy I had this stashed away somewhere. Nice. Uh yeah, we'd we'd put in links to where you can read this comic yourself, but it doesn't exist. So um you may have to try and find it. I don't even know, eBay, eBay, Amazon, your local friendly game store, friendly comic store. Track down your weird friend who somehow found it. Yep. Like. <laughs> and pay them a lot of money. Weird friend. There's some implications there. I Yeah. Sorry about that. I take that back because I'm the weird friend I who know, has it. Exactly. And shared it with my friends. Right. Bringing exactly. it in, sharing it over the lunch table. Like, guys, look at what I got. All right. let's right. Let's wrap up this. $5. 12 issue mini comic episode that's going way long uh, and dive into some artistic license. Have all four sidekicks ever been in the same place at the same time? Don't. 
call us sidekicks. In Artistic License, we will be recommending individual issues, miniseries, and graphic novel collections, both from DC and other companies who have titles we think Young Justice fans will enjoy. Artistic License is designed to give you an on-ramp into the classic story arcs of the past so you might catch a glimpse of what's to come in the future. And for this weirdly final, I hope, comics commentary. Let's not hope. Let's hope well, there are oh, more. Let's hope there are someday. more. Yeah, okay. That's that's let's fair. Let's hope this is the last one we forgot about. Somebody's yeah. gonna crawl out of the woodwork and be like, <laughs> look at this comic that was posted that's... on a billboard one time. <laughs> right. Review it. Right. Uh but <laughs> this hand Emily... sketched comic from a bulletin board. <laughs> Emily's Emily has our artistic license for this week. Yes, I do. Uh, I am recommending a Marvel comic, not DC, so probably won't show up in season three because that would be really weird. Uh, but I am recommending Miss Marvel, the current ongoing that started in 2014 from Marvel Comics about Kamala Khan, the legacy hero, technically, of Carol Danvers, the original Miss Marvel, uh, turned Captain Marvel. And now Kamala Khan is being Miss Marvel. And it is just fabulous. It is amazing teen superhero content. It has made me cry more than once because it is just so well written and so emotionally driven and deals with everything you want from teen superheroes, whether that is awkward romantic relationships or trying to juggle everything in school all of the time or... <laughs> keeping secrets from your friends and family or having to punch a dinosaur in the face or living up to Iron Man's expectations of you and figuring out how to balance your schedule or literally anything. Kamala Khan is an incredible character. They just recently passed 50 issues of this series. All of it is available on Comixology and I cannot recommend it enough. She is fantastic. I love every issue of this series. I love everything they have dealt with in this series and how genuine and heartfelt all of it feels. I love it. I I've I read the first few issues and I thought it was fantastic, but like most of my comics these days, I don't have a lot of time to read, but I have heard nothing but amazing things about this series for the last what, 4 or 5 years. So Yeah. Yep. And one of the one of the great things about it that I super appreciate, even though I've been reading it from the beginning, is that every single issue starts with a little recap page, like their credits page also includes a little recap blurb giving you Kamala's origin story and whatever you've missed in like the last five to ten issues that might be important in this upcoming one. So you can jump in almost anywhere and it will like fill you in on the crash course of what you need to understand that issue and then you can decide whether or not you want to go back yeah i <laughs> that's something it's it, so much it's something that kind of needs to be adopted like that and the concept that that uh, christopher jones was throwing out at us that every like major character needs to have a separate line that's family friendly as in great for adults great for kids that's Ms. just se separate from the main continuity of the rest of the DC or and or Marvel and or Dark Horse universe or whatever because that way you have a consistent thing that you can have to get new ki new people into the storylines whether they're adults or not or new kids picking up and they don't have to go dig around for stuff and one of the best things in my opinion about having a recap page rather than like in universe expo exposition is that if i am catching up and binging a bunch of comics in like a, a day that I've missed for a couple of months. You can, you skip can just skip that recap yeah. page. If you don't need it, you just flip to the next one and you don't have to worry about it. But yeah. if you are reading this for the first time, you can read that recap page and it's all good. If it's been a month since the last issue and you need a little bit of a, a reminder, it's right there. Yeah. It's great. This is also a series that for several issues in their most recent run, Kamala just wasn't there. Kamala left and it made perfect sense, and they were able to continue a story without their main title character for like three, four issues, and it felt perfectly natural and fantastic, which just speaks to how good all of the supporting characters are oh, in yeah. the series, too. Oh, yeah, that's an amazing achievement. Like... She just peaced out, and I like part of me is like, "Oh no, Ms. Marvel, where are you going?" And then everything else, I was like, "But this story is still fantastic and is still great, and I'm loving it." So, I can't say enough great things about Ms. Marvel. Well, thank you for recommending this to me <laughs> because now I'm gonna want to read it. I don't have any time. 
Do it. I get to do it. All right, we're going to do it. All right, and with that, I think we can wrap up this really long recap of a 12-issue comic uh, and head out of the Watchtower. The best way to support the show, of course, is to share it with a friend. You can also support us with a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. Leaving a rating or review pushes us up in the search ranks and helps other people find the show. So also please continue to hashtag buy YJ Comics on Comixology. You sadly can't buy this one, but you can buy literally right. every other one. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> uh, and remember to buy the show somewhere online while we wait for that DC streaming service to launch, DC Universe. It is going to be soon. Fall. Soon. Fall. We don't know exactly when that is, but soon. I heard a rumor today, which by the time this airs, may be confirmed but that uh google play which is the android's kind of app store has some kind of access to the dc universe app for beta testers so i don't know if you're if that's your that's your platform of choice you might want to take a look around okay uh and if you want to help us get more episodes more secret origins more actual play podcasts and more of everything else that we do please consider supporting us through Patreon. For just a few dollars a month, you can help us do even more with the show while getting some great rewards for yourself. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.